here. So, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that's been going on in my lab over the last five years in trying to scale down uh, robotic systems and some of the collaborations especially that we've had uh, with other faculty and ISR uh, to try to make this possible. So I always like to start off presentations by answering the question, or providing my answer to the question of what is a micro robot. So you get 10 micro roboticists in a room and we'll all give you a completely different definition of a micro robot. In my case, I'm pretty much talking about this ant right here. So I want something that size-wise is total size on the order of millimeters, kind of features on the order of microns, which tends to imply microfabrication in some fashion. It doesn't have to be microfabrication, but usually some method of microfabrication is involved um, to get these small robots. Uh, the mobility part of it, right, I want these robots to be able to move through all sorts of different environments, not just be limited to silicon wafers or tabletops or something like that. I want it to be able to move across the carpet and move from the tabletop to the carpet eventually and do all of these other interesting things. Um, and I want it to do that at reasonable speeds. So if it takes all day to move across this table, um, I don't consider that a super reasonable speed. I want it to be able to move at many body lengths per second, just like some of the insects. Uh, that we're modeling some of these things after or being inspired from are doing. And then finally I add a question mark uh, next to autonomy because there's a big question as to how much autonomy you ultimately want on board a robot of this size. Right? Do you want the robot to contain its own power? Do you want the robot to be able to uh, react to its environment and control itself through that environment? Um, do you want the robot to be able to talk to other robots? So these are all kind of open questions um, in my mind as well. Um, but I would say kind of as a, as a naive, simple answer, I just want to stick as much as possible on this little robot. Um, I want it to be able to do uh, similarly impressive things to what uh, this ant uh, can do uh, when you look at it um, from afar. So be able to coordinate with other ants um, in order to do some interesting tasks. So. Yeah, I'd like to see as much as possible uh, end up on the robot. So that's my kind of definition. And so I think a natural extension of that is, you know, well, how close are we to achieving that kind of goal of this ant? So you can actually take this all the way back to, uh, uh, to the 1950s, and Richard Feynman has one of the first mentions of micro robots in tiny hands building tiny hands building tiny hands. Um, interestingly, uh, this talk that he gave, there's plenty of room at the bottom, was December 26th. Um, and I find it very odd that I don't think you'd have many big lectures on two days after, or a day after Christmas these days. But um, anyway, it's very interesting. He mentioned again in 1983, so Richard Feynman was obviously thinking micro robots to some degree. In this case, he mentioned something a little more along the lines of what I just defined as a micro robot, a mobile micro robot. And he was, he was relating uh, video games were starting to become a little more prominent in the early 80s. And so he, he mentioned the idea of having, being able to control two paramecians sword fighting each other at some point. So that's a little more on the lines of what I've been talking about. And then there was a real explosion of research, I would say, in this area um, in, the, in the late 90s and, and the, the last decade. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that you started to have uh, MEMS, microelectromechanical systems, started to become more prominent. So you had the ability to make small mechanisms, to make small motors, to make small sensors. Uh, you could already make integrated circuits to do the control. Uh, you could add power in some sort of fashion. So people started to really think about how you would integrate all of these things together and make small robots. And so there's work at, uh, um, so this is some things that you'll see later. This is part of uh, my PhD work um, with Seth Holler and Anita Flynn. Uh, so Anita Flynn was thinking about these things in, in 1987 as well, NAT robots, and how they will change robotics. Um, not quite yet, but we're still working on that. Um, and so we have the only robot that's actually walked forward right here uh, by Ebifors, and you'll see what the challenges of that are in a little bit. Um, we have these little things uh, that can kind of move across uh, tailored substrates, uh, and the idea being that they could assemble things along those lines. You have little magnetic things. This is from uh, Brad Nelson's lab in Zurich at ETHC where they're, they're trying to get these things to swim through your eyeball and deliver drugs to, to your retina and stuff. Um, Rob Wood's work up at Harvard is doing all sorts of cool things with flying insects. Um, there's a big project in Europe uh, on the eye swarm robots, um, which I haven't seen a lot of stuff come out of, but 
you know, they were trying to make these small robots that could crawl around less than centimeter cube size, and, and some recent work from our lab that you'll see in this presentation. So this is not to scale. I would say there's still a big white space between, between here and here. Um, so we still have a long ways to go, but we're, we're getting there. And the question is why it's so hard. Well, this is, uh, like I said, work from my PhD. And what you're seeing here are two L-shaped legs um, that are moving. And these are two slider crank mechanisms. There are hinges in here. So this thing is basically trying to pull itself forward. This is a little roll bar to protect the legs because they're incredibly fragile and they pull off. And what you see here is a, is, it's completely autonomous in the sense that it's solar powered. Um, the control is on board. Uh, there's no sensing on this, but it's completely autonomous otherwise. And it's doing really awesome little micro robot push-ups. Um, so we want this thing to actually walk forward. It did, you know, he let it run for like a half an hour and it did kind of scoot a couple millimeters to the side. And so he said, yay, I graduate, I get my PhD and he's gone. So we'd like to actually get that to, to, to move in, in a more dramatic fashion. Um, but this is really hard, it turns out. So this is the whole robot here. This is just the part you saw in the video right there. So the whole thing is about eight and a half millimeters by about three and a half millimeters. So there's a motor coming up each side of here. Uh, this is a whole bank of solar cells to provide power and a little control chip hanging off the back. All right, so one of the really hard things is mobility. So even if this guy was able to walk, it would trip up over most laminate surfaces because they're too rough for this robot. All right, so how you move over uh, relatively rough terrain when you're really, really small, because there's a lot of rough terrain when you're really small, is, is a big question that we're trying to answer. Another one is how you design the mechanisms in order to both enable that mobility and to enable robustness in your environment is another big part of this. Um, so how we design those, those mechanisms um, to get our mobility. Um, ultimately, one of the failure points of this robot was the motors. Um, in this case, uh, the motors didn't provide us enough force density to actually pull the robot forward. So we're trying to make motors with much higher force densities and much higher power densities, ultimately, uh, to be able to get really impressive mobilities here. Um, integration is another step. So we lost a lot of these robots. These are made in three different manufacturing processes and then wire bonded together. So there's an ultrasonic wire bond that comes in and buzzes this thing, basically. And then everything breaks and you have to start over again. So making things that are easy to integrate. Um, but I also in, in that include things like the control and how you in incorporate sensing and, and, and uh, control into these robots as well. And then finally, the big uh, elephant in the room that nobody pays attention to being power. Um, how you add power on board these robots in a robust fashion. So really the goal in, in my lab so far here has been to uh, take our expertise that we have in microfabrication, mix that with some inspiration from biology uh, in order to really uh, start developing some of these, these mobile micro robots. And we're also doing things in terms of uh, uh, you know, other things that you would think about in terms of adding actuation mechanisms and sensing uh, together, other kind of robotic systems, not necessarily mobile. Um, but this is kind of one of the, the primary thrusts in my lab at the moment. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, efficacy and efficiency of locomotion in tiny robots, how we get these things to move, um, really expanding the materials toolbox that we have available to us in, in creating mechanisms and where we're going with that. Uh, electrostatics uh, for motors, chemical actuation for motors, and where we're going with all of that. Um, integration, so connecting all of the pieces together and really adding perception and control for the first time on these small robots. And then uh, I'll include a little bit of power in, in the motors section as well. So, so start with the efficacy and feel free to ask questions throughout here as well. Um, like I mentioned before, when you're really tiny, everything's really challenging to get around. All right, terrain is rough, obstacles are large. Um, some of the robots that I showed you earlier, if you look at what they would be able to, wh what they would ultimately be tripped up by, uh, the, ro the push-up robot there, if there was pollen in its path, it'd be like, oh, I can't get over it. Um, this guy right here is the only one that's actually walked. It would certainly be tripped up by hair. Um, and this guy would be tripped up by anything, pretty much, on the, on the substrate. So it would, that needs to be a perfectly clean substrate to, to be able to move. So, so this isn't really a problem that people have thought about a lot in, in robots of this size, at least, of how you would able get around, ultimately. 
So one of the things um, uh, when I was a graduate student, I was, you know, this was truly nature inspired in that I actually found the article in the journal Nature. Um, but looking at the frog hopper insect, and as I was looking at this, they were declaring it the champion jumping insect. Um, as I was looking at this, I was like, oh, these are actually parameters I think we could actually engineer in, in a system like this. And so quick MATLAB simulation shows you with various kind of energies that you have to start, um, if you have 10 microjoules, you can jump about you know, 5 centimeters high and 17 centimeters in distance with uh, 10 milligrams, which was the mass of that push-up robot, and, and a takeoff angle of 45 degrees. So the dashed lines are in vacuum and the solid lines are in air. So you actually see you're really at kind of this boundary where you have um, some really interesting uh, kind of Reynolds numbers as well. You're talking about Reynolds numbers of, you know, a couple hundred basically. So drag actually becomes an interesting uh, force on your robot. And then you have, you know, even if I only had a microjoule in the tank, I could still jump about two centimeters um, each time I jump and about you know, half a centimeter high. So you can actually get some reasonable interesting jumps and you could get over reasonably interesting terrain with this sort of thing. But a big question is, is it efficient? So in biology, robot in insects that tend to jump tend to do it as a very energetically costly mechanism to get away from your hand that is a, as it is coming down to swat at the insect. Right? So they only do it rarely. So it's really, it turns out it's really challenging to think about efficiency uh, in mobility, primarily because it's very dependent on implementation. So if you look at two walking robots that are out there, so Honda Asimo robot, and this very interesting kind of uh, semi-passive walker robot from Cornell. Um, they're both walking at the same uh, speed over the same terrain, and one takes 768 watts uh, to do that, and the other takes about 12 and a half watts to do that. And that is entirely an implementation type, dependent type thing. So we started trying to, you know, we, we came up with a couple uh, simple models that I really won't go into, but looking at cost of transport as the energy it takes to move a given mass, a given distance in gravity. Um, and, and biologists use this to kind of compare across uh, uh, different size scales and compare across different organisms. So if you look at a biological baseline in this case of an average ant, so it's not a particularly speedy ant or a slow ant, kind of an average ant, it would take about 15 seconds to move a meter and it would take about a millijoule and a half to do that. Right, the push-up robot, had it been able to actually walk forward uh, the way we wanted it to, would have taken about seven hours to move that meter. So once again, all day to walk across the table. Um, and 130 millijoules to do that, primarily because it would take seven hours to, to move across the table. It was otherwise fairly low power. Uh, the one that's actually walked, you can see the real kicker right here. It would be able to you know, move a meter in about three minutes, but it would take 180 joules to do that. Not millijoules, but 180 joules to do that. Um, and then some other things. And then we started playing around with some numbers for jumping, and this is, these are all simulated numbers or cons you know, analytical numbers right here. But actually matches the ant fairly well here. It would take about um, uh, uh, 0.2 minutes to, to, to move, a little less than 15 seconds to move that meter. Um, and about two and a half millijoules to do that. So we thought actually jumping maybe not so bad. Um, and there's, there's a lot of caveats along that, but it ultimately is not this really energetically costly thing uh, to do at this size scale. So we've, we've, we've taken a little step back and started to try to think about um, adding dynamics to our mobility. And uh, a student, uh, Chris Brown, who's also at the Applied Physics Lab, um, along with Dana Voltman have started looking at this in a platform that, that Chris put together. And the basic idea of this is he has a, uh, that is a, a average sized hand, that is not a baby hand or anything, but the, the whole platform is about six and a half centimeters uh, long, about five and a half uh, centimeters wide, and the thing can really book. As far as I know, it's the fastest in terms of body lengths per second that's out there. So it moves at about 2.2 uh, meters per second at its max speed. Um, so what we're really interested in doing with this platform, it's a great platform because the, each of these kind of wheel leg things is directly driven. Each of, it has, each of them has their, its own motor associated with it. So given this, we can actually start playing with some really interesting gates uh, in, in robots of this size. Most of the robots of this size are under-actuated, meaning you have fewer motors controlling the same number of legs. 
And so it's really hard to start playing around with how you can more efficiently and effectively locomote through various terrains. So using this, we can start uh, really looking at this problem in greater depth. And we started by just playing around with different legs with basically different stiffnesses and found some very interesting uh, cost of transport data where we get these interesting peaks in this data depending on how fast the robot's moving. So this is all stuff that we're actually kind of is work in progress. This is uh, at ICRA this year, but um, I think a lot of interesting things to go along with this. And we actually have some nice dynamic models that we're, we're trying to develop with this as well uh, for the locomotion. So this is great. This is wonderful, and I think it's a lot of fun. But the real question, I still want to make it small like that, and I want to see how we test these kind of locomotion things at smaller scales. And so in order to do that, we really need the mechanisms. Uh, to do that, especially to make things as dynamic as that one that you just saw. So at the very small scale, at the MEM scale, this is uh, the legs on that push-up robot once again. Um, things you can make very, very small legs, very, very small mechanisms, but you're generally very limited in material choices. So the traditional MEMS materials are silicon, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, these kind of things, some metals tend to be very, at least the, the silicon and derivatives seem to be, tend to be very brittle, um, not very robust. Um, so we'd like to actually play around with some more materials that we can put at this scale. At larger scales, we have all sorts of materials that we can play around with. So this is Rob Wood's work that's not at that much larger of a scale, um, but he can put in all sorts of different materials, metals, polymers, uh, carbon fiber, and actually get some really interesting functionality for his uh, micro-flying insect. So what we really want to do is take some of the materials that you could play with if you wanted to build a larger robot and incorporate those in the manufacturing processes that you have for much smaller robots. So we want to expand that materials toolbox uh, dramatically. So this is uh, the work of Aaron Garrett, uh, who will be graduating uh, shortly. So Aaron basically took, uh, uh, created essentially a micro molding process uh, to incorporate these elastomers. So we take something called a silicon on insulator wafer. So it has a silicon layer, an oxide layer, and then another silicon layer. We do a deep reactive ion etch, which is basically a cookie cutter etch into this silicon. Um, and then we, we refill uh, all of those trenches that we just etched into that silicon with an elastomer, like PDMS. So basically a silicone rubber. All right, so we refill all of those trenches with that elastomer. Then we can do another etch around it. And so we can end up with uh, kind of elastomer pieces and silicon pieces uh, all together here. And then we release everything. So we etch the backside, we remove the oxide underneath these pieces. And now we have basically little springs that we can store energy in for jumping robots, grippy surfaces, uh, potentially little compliant joints for legs and stuff. So we can do a lot of different things uh, once we have uh, this released here. And there's some interesting things of you know, how, how this elastomer survives the release, and there's some interesting kind of MEMS work in here as well. But what we were really interested in, okay, so now we have this process where we can incorporate these little rubber pieces in our MEMS, um, but we really need to better characterize them, come up with a better model of all of these things so that we can actually design with them and, and play with our robots. So, uh, this is uh, some other work that Aaron has done in order to characterize these elastomers. The typical way to do this, um, and what you see most commonly in the literature, is somebody will take the same elastomer, make a bigger sample of it, and start stretching it and, and try to get the material properties of the elastomer that way. So it turns out, though, that the, man the manufacturing process will add all sorts of interesting things uh, to that elastomer. So we created an in situ, uh, basically created a test device in the wafer itself. And in this case, uh, we just have basically giant comb drives that are going to be moving up and down and stretching this elastomer back and forth. And we do some interesting calibration with this comb drive so we can actually get the actual force that we're applying uh, to this, not a calculated force. So we have an idea of what force we're applying to this. And then we have some interesting little uh, 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 features here that we can pick out very accurate displacements um, as to how far we've stretched this elastomer. So essentially with this, we're interested in getting kind of the material properties of, of these elastomers after they've gone through the process. So we've done that. So the black lines here are the macro scale tests. That's just I pour my elastomer, I cut it out, and I test it on a bigger setup. 
Um, and those are cured at different temperatures. So you can see things like the curing temperature between these three black lines makes a big difference in the, the modulus of the, of the finished material. Um, and then the blue lines are taken from the, the blue and the red are taken from the microscale test setup. And those are released, so I, I mentioned that you have this release at the end. Oops. There. You have this release at the end where you actually dunk it in hydrofluoric acid. Um, so that's going to change the material properties quite a bit as well. So the blue line is we leave it in the uh, buffered HF for five hours, and the red line is for eight hours. So we get some, the, the lesson to take away from this, uh, hopefully, is that you can't just use your, your macro scale material properties. They're not going to translate necessarily. So you have to kind of incorporate how the, ma the material processing is going to affect the material properties um, in the end. So, so this was actually some very interesting uh, uh, recent work with this. So now we can go back to some of the legs that we designed earlier. We were just, oh, let's throw some legs on the mask. We'll, we'll make some legs and we'll make them move and stuff. So we did this and we got legs that could wiggle around and, and that was very fun. But now we actually can go back with the, the better material models that we have and actually design some really interesting legs so that we can ultimately get to the kind of mobility that you saw in, in Chris's robot running around. Um, so that's our, our goal basically with this. Um, in order to do that, though, when we were doing this, we realized, OK, these legs you know, don't bend quite the way we expect them to bend. They bend and stretch at the same time. So we need better models to kind of incorporate these weird hinges that we're creating out of these elastomers now. So this is work uh, with Dana Votman and actually uh, SK as well in terms of uh, trying to create better models for these. And so we've basically created a, another process that's basically a large-scale version of the MEMS process I just told you about. So in this case, these white links are rigid, Delrin, and then we pour the same PDMS in there to create these same kind of links. So the problem is that the traditional model that people use is this pseudo-rigid body model where they say, I'm just going to replace that joint with a torsion spring and be done with it. Now the problem is our, we can bend like a torsion spring, but we also stretch quite a lot. And so what Dana's done is actually um, come up with a, a nice model of this from both experimental results in FEA and shown that in this particular leg even, this one spring model actually won't even get us how the, won't even work with this leg, even though this leg actually works just fine. So you need to incorporate all three springs for this leg to work. So this, this uh, one where you see these little singularities, here's the one spring model, the solid line is FEA, and then the, the dash line that follows that solid line is the three spring model. So we actually have a pretty decent model um, for how to, how to model these joints now. And actually John Barris has taken some of this stuff. I'm very disappointed he's not here, in fact. Um, John has taken some of this stuff and started to think about, you know, if I'm trying to design a system and I can play with the geometry and the material, what are some of the interesting you know, choices that I have in designing that system? So that's of, of great interest to us as well. So taking a step back, though, from legs, we, uh, we can actually design some more simple uh, type features to actually still get interesting locomotion. So going back to the jumping that I always wanted to do. So this is a little uh, device that, that Aaron put together. So it's about four millimeters by four millimeters in size. So you can see very clearly where the, the rubber bits are and where the silicon bits are. And the basic idea is this is a little jumping mechanism. So there's no motors on board this or anything. But you're going to compress this little guy and release it and, and show that we can actually release that energy in an effective way to get a decent jump. And so we were able to show that. So what you'll see on the next video is a little blurry dot kind of flying through the air. But this gives you some uh, sense of size once again. Um, so there it goes. There's a little blurry dot right there. Um, there's another little blurry dot flying through the air, and you can actually see it hit the ground and bounce several times, which most MEMS people would be like, ah, that's destroying my MEMS, but this is very, very robust in the end. Um, so, so we actually get fairly decent uh, heights out of this, given the, the energy that we store in this as well. So this whole thing is jumping, I think ultimately it got something like uh, close to 90x its height in terms of jump height. But like I said, no motors or battery on board, so there's still a long way to go.
No, no, so this is not autonomous at all. This is Aaron with tweezers going like this. Um, and it does not jump the same each time because it's actually really hard to release the tweezers appropriately in order for it to get that jump. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ah, so that will involve perception stuff that I can talk about later. But you could ultimately, with the motors that I'll tell you about, decide how high you want to jump. So you wouldn't need to jump the same height each time. Because actually, if you go back to that MATLAB plot of the jump trajectories, you take an efficiency hit if you jump high each time because of drag at this scale. So if you could jump kind of little jumps until you need a big jump, you could end up being much more efficient ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yep, basically this right here. You have that little device, you squish it down, stretch the springs, and then you release, and it goes. Right. So no motors incorporated yet, but you'll see where we're getting with that toward the end. But I mean, if there was no human there, is there some automated way that you could accomplish the same thing? Yes, that's what I will get to next. Very good question, though. All right, so, so where we're going with the mechanisms, um, it turns out this process is, is very versatile in that we can actually incorporate other elastomers in this as well, or other polymers potentially, um, and get all sorts of interesting things. So instead of just regular silicone rubber, we can incorporate urethanes that could give us more damping that we might want in legs, for example, for control. Uh, we can incorporate uh, conductive elastomers as well. So uh, right now we have a new grant to create kind of skins based on, on these kind of processes. Um, magnetic particles you could incorporate. There's all sorts of different things that you could potentially do with this uh, process that we're working on um, currently. So to that question, motors. How do we add the motors on board in order to stretch the springs in order to jump or in order to drive the legs and, and move the way we want to do? So it turns out the kind of prior art in motors is, is pretty sparse as far as uh, robots go. So people have worked in kind of electrostatics, um, but most of the stuff that you've seen is thermal actuators just because they tend to be uh, easier to work with. So thermal actuators just rely on heating up a material and, look, and using the expansion of that material as you heat it up, but it takes a lot of power to heat it up. At larger scales, people have played with more, more interesting materials. So there's dielectric elastomers, there's little micro rockets that people put together, uh, there's piezoelectrics that Rob uses on his uh, flying insects and such. Um, but these material properties tend to be hard to translate down to smaller scales. So of course, we want it all in our small micro robot motors. We want high force and power density, uh, we want efficient actuation, and we want very small scales for our robots. So one of the ways we've done this is started looking at, uh, we've continued looking at electrostatic inchworm motors. So the idea here is that you have these arrays of uh, electrostatic gap closing actuators. So it's basically just a capacitor. You apply a voltage and you'll move. All right? That gap there is going to determine the force that you get out. So the smaller the gap, the more force. And the higher the voltage, the more force that you get out. So in this case, you have very small gaps, because you can microfabricate these things, so micron gaps, basically. Um, but then you don't move very far, you only move a micron. So in order to move much larger distances, we accumulate all those very small displacements in this inchworm fashion uh, to get much, much larger displacements. And this is a very easy process to build something like this in. So we're going to accumulate all those displacements in this shuttle down here. So we're going to grab that shuttle, pull it forward, grab the shuttle, pull it forward, grab the shuttle, pull it forward, grab the shuttle, pull it forward. All right, and you can keep doing this. You can do this really fast because all of these masses are small, so you actually have very high resonant frequencies and everything. All right, so Yvonne took that idea and said, well, this is stupid. Like, why do we have this little actuator right here grabbing the shuttle? That just looks like a giant parasitic capacitor, which is hurting both my force density and my efficiency. So I can get rid of this extra little actuator here and replace that just with a mechanism. So this is Yvonne Penske's work. Um, so in this case, we have just a, a little uh, angled flexure arm. So we have now just actuators moving up and down, and that angled flexure is going to translate that to, to lateral motion in our shuttle. 
And so the benefits of this, of course, is it reduces the size, it improves the efficiency, and it increases the speed. And it's very rare that you get all of those in one go. All right, so uh, he's put this together. So there's the little uh, angled uh, arm there. And these are the actuators that are moving up and down, uh, pushing this central shuttle back and forth here. All right, so the total force out of this particular device was about 2.2 millinewtons. Um, if you remove the springs at the end of this, you could just keep pushing as long as you have shuttle there. Um, we've actually measured efficiencies close to 10%, and that's including all the parasitic capacitance in the test setup, so I think it's much, much higher than that. Um, speed is close to 5 millimeters per second, and if you look at power density here, you're looking at something like 200 watts per kilogram. Now that's cheating a little bit because that is removing the substrate layer here, which isn't actually adding any actuation here, but it is kind of connecting the pieces together. So you would actually need to complicate your fabrication process a little bit to get this. But 200 watts per kilogram. Muscle is about 100 watts per kilogram. And we can actually push this a lot further, uh, I think, once we understand the dynamics a little bit better. So this is, I think, a really kind of nice actuator that's really simple to fabricate and integrate, potentially, in our robots. And I should mention he did a very nice optimization of this as well in, in designing these motors. So this is how they work. So these are these uh, angled arms, once again, and you have these uh, arrays of these gap-closing actuators up here. So this is at already at 10 times slower speed. This was captured at 300 frames per second. So see it grabbing, you can see these, these uh, angled flexures at the end, uh, st sorry, not the angled flexures, these folded flexures at the end stretching as it pushes that shuttle forward. And this is also at 300 frames per second, but you can see it can actually move pretty fast. So it's moving 10 times faster than you're seeing there as well. So these things can actually move pretty quickly. All right, so we've taken that same idea of electrostatics and actually incorporated those new materials that we're using as well in, in creating these small actuators too. Sarah, yeah. Uh huh. So uh, maybe wrong about this, but I thought the idea is to use the shuttle mechanism to somehow load your PDMS frames, right? Yes. So to, the, to do the, as opposed to this vibratory demonstration you did. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that you need to somehow have some holding force in the horizontal direction to be able to withstand that. Even when you have this uh, angle flexion mechanism, yeah, it? correct. You basically need to be able to hold that in place. And, and so, what is it that does that? Can so it's the same thing. You basically clamp down onto that shuttle, um, and so there's actually little teeth on here. Oh, teeth. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's teeth um, on this particular case. We looked at using kind of the elastomer on the on the sidewalls. Um, you get some some shear forces in that elastomer, and we can't make it thin enough. Uh, to not get substantial shear forces just in the elastomer. So we could never actually push it forward um, with the elastomer so um, to create a higher friction interface, basically. During the course of the motor operation, the teeth have to come out of contact. Mm -hmm. So then, is it possible in this an applied loading force that it will slip back? Or it would slip back a little bit, potentially. It yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. All right, so we've taken the, the same basic principle of electrostatics using new materials. Um, so in this case, uh, all elastomers, and the thing I love about using all elastomers for our motors is those were still silicon. So I, I dropped those and, and everything would break. In this case, I have just elastomer materials so I can roll them up, squish them, step on them, whatever, and they'll, they'll still work ultimately. So that's the nice thing about these. Um, and so the basic principle behind these uh, dielectric elastomer actuators is that you have compliant electrodes, a compliant dielectric, and you apply a voltage. And in addition to kind of moving down like we did previously, you also increase your area by doing that just by the fact that these uh, rubber materials have a Poisson ratio of 0.5, basically. So in this case, you have uh, conductive electrodes. Uh, you're looking at a bimorph, so this is kind of top down. You have conductive electrodes on the outsides and in the middle, and then these layers two and four are dielectrics. So the basic principle is I apply a voltage between these two conductive layers, and I'll squish down and squish out, and because I'm squishing out, I'll bend up in this direction. I apply a voltage between these two, this layer will, will lengthen, and I'll, I'll move down. So it's a, a basic bimorph here. <coughs> 
All right, so we actually demonstrated this. Uh, this actually works reasonably well. We can move this back and forth. Uh, we can actually get reasonable displacements at the end of this. Um, the, the pitfalls of this are, are, are a couple at the moment. One is this 1100 volts up here. All right, so 1,000 volts, you know, I can deal with maybe 100 volts that I was using to drive that interim motor, but 1,000 volts is pushing it for me. So in this case, uh, one solution that we have for this is this was made with an inexpensive mask, meaning all of these lines are 20 microns wide, effectively. We can make lines that are 2 microns wide in our clean room, and in that case, we can actually make this 100 volts instead because this is based on electric field here. So that's one solution that we can look at. Uh, another, another issue with this is force, right? So I basically just end up with a little rubber beam and I get no force out of that. So another thing that we can do because we're microfabricating this, we can actually stack these and get decent displacements and decent forces at the same time. Sarah, can this be used as a sensor? Yes, that's exactly what we're doing for our skins at the moment. So you're thinking of little hair sensors and stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you wouldn't get 1,100 volts out of it. So, so what you would get is a change of capacitance out of it, right? But the interesting thing is that there's a lot of chips out there right now because of things like cell phones and stuff where you're trying to read changes in capacitance that can actually read, you know, pretty small changes in capacitance down to femtofarads, basically. Just very cheap commercially available chips. So, so yes, you could use it for something like that. And you could make arrays of them very easily in the microfab process. Yes. We didn't have any problems with breakdown and error in this particular case. Um, so interestingly though, what we have done, and this is um, work that is in revisions right now, is looked at the breakdown of PDMS because you go back to the literature and the breakdown of PDMS is all over the place, right? People report all sorts of different numbers. So because we can make these kind of two micron thick layers, we can actually look at the breakdown over a, a lot of different things. And it turns out you get most of what people are reporting is the breakdown of air um, in these things. So we can actually coat the whole thing with uh, PDMS and we actually get some really nice PDMS breakdown numbers. Um, and it changes based on the gap. In fact, the breakdown field will go up as the gap gets smaller. Um, so there's, there's some interesting, interesting things there that we've, we've recently found out. But we didn't actually run into breakdown in air. All right, so, so as a completely different direction for motors and one that would also incorporate power, um, this is uh, Wayne Turman's work, who's also an employee at ARL is looking at energetics materials. So if you want to try to create a small jumping robot, one way to do that is generate thrust through a mechanism like we were talking about, or thrust through, the, uh, through expelling lots of gas very quickly. So in this case, he etches a lot of silicon into this kind of nanoporous material. Uh, so a lot of surface area, adds sodium, sodium perchlorate, um, and adds a little energy, and you get something like this. So big boom, basically. Um, and we can address, we can create arrays of these. Uh, you can pattern little wires over it. So you shove a current through there and it will heat it up enough to set off these guys individually. So you can create arrays and set off different ones at different times if you want. So this is a completely different actuator direction, but one that actually you'll see again uh, toward the end. So basically a little micro rocket of sorts. All right, so where we're we going with these motors. Um, uh, so. I'll, I'll, I'll skip to the, the bit that I, I think is most interesting. Obviously, we want to get a better understanding of the dynamics to really push the, the power density of some of those inchworm actuators. Um, I think the DEAs still have quite a lot of promise uh, in this particular fabrication process. And one of the things that I'd really love to do is take these microactuators and actually scale them in a way that's appropriate for use on slightly larger scale robots. So instead of ant-sized robots, maybe something the size of my hand instead. And that's what we've started really looking at doing. So this is work with uh, Sean Humbert and Paul Samuel, Sean being in, in the aerospace engineering department here. Um, so we're looking at basically how you control a, a little micro air vehicle in gusty conditions. So it turns out a lot of the lightweight actuators you can get are not high enough bandwidth to do something like that. 
So in this case, we have a little, uh, this is just an off-the-shelf actuator to, to prove the concept uh, right now. It's just a little magnetic coil actuator. And we have basically an inverted pendulum. So this uh, pendulum part of it is the same inertia as the microair vehicle that we're going to try to control. And there's a little board on here, so the only sensing available is just the inertial state of the, pen of the, uh, the inverted pendulum part. And then to control that, we're using this, this magnetic actuator and a tail. So it turns out uh, a cruel biologist at some point tried to figure out how birds were stabilizing themselves on limbs, and they thought, mm, maybe it's inertial, maybe it's uh, aerodynamic. So this, this little bird was able to stabilize itself. They pluck all the feathers. It's still able to stabilize itself. So they concluded an inertial uh, effect versus a, uh, an aerodynamic one. So in any case, uh, we actually showed this, this thing working. Um, so this little inverted pendulum test setup. So there's no, no, no sensor determining the state of the, of the tail at all. But once you turn on the, the control, you can actually stabilize this thing. You can shake it around a bit, um, and it actually does fairly well in terms of robustness. Now we've taken this same idea, I have a really smart undergraduate in the lab, Carlos, who's taken this tail idea and put it on little ground robots, the little $10 robots that you buy from Radio Shack. Um, and the, the basic idea of that is they could turn something like this. You know, they can take these very long sweeping turns, but we want it to be really dynamic. So he's added the same kind of tail to that robot and he can actually spin it in place almost 360 degrees and go running off in the other direction. So there's some really cool stuff that you can do and there's some really interesting scaling with this as well down to our smaller robot sizes too. All right, so finally integration. We want to add it all together ultimately and there's a lot of stuff there. So. Um, this kind of goes to the, the perception question uh, that came up earlier is kind of what the minimal perception that we need is on these robots to, to uh, do some interesting behaviors. So kind of revisiting Breitenberg's vehicles uh, in some sense uh, as to what we can do with these, these vehicles. So, so one of the things that we've done, and this is in collaboration with uh, Nuno Martins, is um, developing these very small platforms that we call the tiny TERPs, tiny terrestrial robotic platforms. Um, they're approximately a cubic centimeter and a half, or a centimeter and a half on each side. Um, they have a radio that you can put on different sensor boards. So we put on inertial sensors and, and done all sorts of kind of cool things with them in terms of controlling them. Um, and this will be at ICRA this year as well. Um, but ultimately we want to add all of this at the smaller scale. We want to add, in, add together our motors and our sensing and everything at the smaller scale. So. Uh, this goes to an earlier question as well, is how you're going to start loading these elastomers in order, for, in order to jump. So as a, as a first pass at this, we actually uh, used some thermal actuators instead, which is kind of cheating, but we could use our new electrostatic interim motors in this case now. Um, and so the basic idea is that we have these motors that are going to push this leg back, so there's a foot there, it's going to push this dark gray leg back, and these orange bits are the elastomer that's stretching. And we're going to use this as a little catapult to shoot things around the lab. Um, so in this case, uh, what you'll see here, these dark bits are the, uh, the rubber bands here. So you can see these motors moving. This is real time and stretching these rubber bands. And we can put something in front of that foot and shoot it off. Uh, basically shoot it out of the field of view of the camera. Hence the only greater than seven centimeters. We have no idea where it went. So it went far. That's all we can say. So we can actually uh, uh, shoot little things like this. We can you know, actually incorporate motors and mechanisms together in this sense, but we still need power sensing and control. So as a step toward power, uh, this is a new collaboration with Ali Reza, uh, where he has developed this really, really nice compact uh, power electronics interface to drive our electrostatic motors. So these are Vaughn's motors here, and we've shown that this little, little circuit right here that he, he, he can make smaller even um, can actually move that, that motor that I showed you earlier. And so using this, and I think this was about 60 milligrams or something like that, um, and we can make it a lot smaller, a lot lighter weight, we can actually start thinking about driving our legs and doing cool things just from a battery. Um, so this does the, the, the this creates the signal waveform in addition to uh, bumping it up to 110 volts. Uh, to drive these motors.
So it's very nice and compact. And then of course we want to add the sensing and control. All right? And so this is where that little uh, energetic material comes back into play. So this is Wayne's master's work. So we went back and thought about the simplest sensing and the simplest control we could add on board this robot. And the sensor is just a little uh, phototransistor here. The control is just a single MOSFET. And the actuator is one of those uh, energetic dots, basically, on the belly of this little robot. And this big capacitor here supplies power for the sensing circuit. And interestingly, that's a third of the mass of the robot, so we can make this much, much better. Um, and this guy has a charge in it so that when this senses light, it switches this MOSFET and dumps the charge through that little bridge wire and initiates the reaction for a jump. All right, so that's exactly what this guy is doing. So when you turn on the lights and voila, you get a nice big jump out of this thing. There's no confinement uh, on the, on the uh, thruster in this particular, um, this particular demonstration, but we still got an eight centimeter jump out of this thing. Um, and you can see uh, this really nice uh, um, uh, reaction at the beginning, and then this guy kind of slowly tumbling through the air. This is at 1,000 frames per second. So you can actually get some really interesting uh, behaviors out of this, especially once you consider that you can array these devices and once we know the thrust profiles and all of that good stuff. So I'll skip this and, and just go to the... Uh, you know, what we intend to ultimately do with these things in addition to just making little bugs run around and shoot stuff around the lab. A um, lot of obvious uh, applications in kind of search and security, um, mobile sensor networks, um, assembly, these incredible termite mounds are built by these little bitty termites. You know, what kind of things could we do with little robots as well? Um, and of course, there's a lot of micromedical robotics uh, opportunities. Um, out there from a surgery perspective and just medicine in general. Um, but really our goal is kind of, you know, exploring and manipulating in this micro world with some of these small things. Uh, what do you mean by search and security? Search and security, so there are a couple different aspects of this. Um, one would be a uh, kind of search and rescue type thing where I have a pile of rubble somewhere and I dump a bucket full of these micro robots in that pile of rubble where I'm trying to find people and they have just enough energy to be able to say, hey, somebody's here, and then, you know, die or something like that. So that would be a search thing. Um, security would be more kind of reconnaissance type stuff. You dump a bucket of them in a field, and then they tell you if somebody's gone through that field or something like this. So, so that's the, the general idea there. Um, but we're also talking, and we also have some interesting stuff now. We're talking about using these for civil infrastructure monitoring and, and cool things in that regard. Basically mobile sensors. That's what you're looking at. So with that, uh, I will conclude uh, and, and get questions. Um, a lot of students uh, put, in, put in effort into the stuff that I showed you here um, that I named, and a lot of undergraduate researchers that I didn't really name, a lot of uh, funding agencies, NSF, uh, ARL, DARPA primarily. Um, and with that, I will end with a, uh, a little comic. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it yet in one of my talks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for a very nice talk. Now, the floor is open for questions. Yes, So nature has already developed a bunch of motors, like proteins. Mm -hmm. The ones in the in the, in the, in the, in the ear, you have a question. Can you think of integrating those into your... So there are people who are starting to integrate actual biological muscle into kind of... And people have actually been doing this um, much earlier, kind of in the early 90s, I think, with MEMS. They have actually seen kind of heart muscle integrated into a MEMS structure and showing it beat back and forth and stuff. So this is an area that people are thinking about. Um, and it's certainly possible. Uh, um, it becomes a packaging issue, I think, to a large degree at that point. Um, and it requires hundreds of volts. I mean, in the inner ear, you have the outer hair cells. They change their length uh, to a protein that just requires about 50 millivolts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I am, I am all about trying to find better actuators, so yeah. I'm open to it. <laughs> Interestingly, though, the, the interim actuator is actually inspired originally by muscle. 
So the, the way that muscle works and kind of grabbing this central thing and pulling it along, um, same basic idea. All right, everybody's ready to go home. Yeah? You showed at the end uh, some examples of possible future applications that you showed kind of like the power. Mm -hmm. um, something like that, so small uh, insects, they do some level of manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, has your research considered manipulation as well? We have not done manipulation yet, although we have considered, you know, especially because we have these compliant structures. So it turns out in manipulation you can solve a lot of the hairy problems with manipulation through the mechanical design of the gripper, effectively. And so we have looked at possibly using some of our kind of mechanisms that we've designed for legs and jumping things and such to try to create some of these compliant grippers as well. But we haven't actually done that yet, so no. We've thought about it, but no, we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you.